Well, uh, welcome this morning, and it's uh, so good that you could all uh, be with us. We're uh, a Good Friday. We, it's just uh, a real blessing to be able to come together, and this morning we're going to focus uh, on the cross, and then uh, Sunday morning, uh, 10 o'clock here, uh, Don will help us to uh, focus on the resurrection. And uh, in a sense, you can't separate the two. Uh, the cross, Jesus really did die, and the resurrection, God raised him up and declared him to be the Son of God. So uh, we're going to uh, just uh, have, a, have a Bible reading first from uh, Luke 23, if you want to follow along. And uh, Luke 23, commencing at verse 32, two others criminals were also led away to be executed with him and when they arrived at the place called the skull they crucified him there along with the criminals one on the right and one on the left then Jesus says father forgive them because they do not know what they're doing and they divided his clothes and cast lots and the people stood watching and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at, at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since you're undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three, because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle, and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, this man really was righteous or innocent. And all the crowds, when they'd gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, went home striking their chest. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Let's just have a word of prayer as we come to look at this passage. Father, I pray that uh, by your spirit you will help us to come to the cross this morning. And uh, as these onlookers just uh, stood there watching what was happening, may we see not physically, but in our hearts, what God was doing there at the cross. So we pray that you might continue to speak afresh to our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A man called uh, George MacLeod many years ago wrote, I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the centre of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I'm recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap, on a crossroads so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and Latin and Greek at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble. 
because that is where he died and that is what he died about and that is where Christians should be and what Christians should be about. You may have seen uh, pictures uh, often on Easter cards or at this time if you can see past all the chocolate eggs and bunny rabbits and stuff you'll see a picture of a, a hill with three crosses and, uh, and then uh, sometimes they put a really dramatic sky in the background and uh, I don't know about the sky but the three crosses that's not just tradition there really were three crosses there. The Bible says Jesus was crucified with uh, the, the criminals, one on each side of him. And uh, this morning we want to go to those three crosses, not just one but three crosses and have a look at what was happening on those crosses. Um, sometimes movies and other things can really stress the physical side and of, of the crucifixion and crucifixion is a terrible death, probably the most scary death you can go through and yet when we read the Bible it says when they arrived at the place they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. In one sense the Bible simply says he was crucified but it also, the Bible also says that crucifixion had a profound meeting, uh, meaning. Jesus said, I've got a baptism to undergo and how it consumes me until it is finished. This was the whole Jesus looking forward in his whole life towards his death and his, and his resurrection. <clears throat> and at the end of our time together, we're going to have the Lord's table to remember his death and, and at, his, at that last supper where he initiated this time he said this is my body given for you this is my blood the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you and as the Messiah he fulfilled at the cross the Old Testament Isaiah 53 he was pierced because of our rebellion he was crushed because of our iniquities and so there were three men being crucified and again that was no accident because the prophetic word in in Isaiah said that he would be numbered with the transgressors an innocent man yet going to the cross and numbered or looked upon as a criminal so let's go to the first cross. They could have put a, a sign above that first cross on the left, let's say it's the left-hand side, and uh, said criminal, worthy of death. And when, when, a, when a, man, a, a man or woman were, was convicted of a crime, they were taken from the judgment uh, seat and they were escorted by the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, with one of them carrying a placard saying this man with all his crimes that he had committed and it would be like a terrible warning for anyone contemplating that sort of crime. It was just openly declared this is the wrong that this person has done and that's why we have to crucify him. And I want to say this morning that that can be a picture of so many people in their lives we can carry this burden of sin I don't know if you've ever helped someone um, relocate house and everything is in uh, boxes and uh, sometimes if you're lucky the the box that you get to carry just contains the the old dead dead flower arrangements and so on and then and then others you pick up the box and it's just solid books and, uh, and so you pick it up and you think, oh, I got the wrong box. And, uh, and you carry it in and you yell out, you know, where do you want this one? Where do you want this one? And there's no answer because they're out the back sorting out the dead flowers. And, and so you, you've got a, this box and your arms are starting to ache. And I want to, you to see that this man 
on the first cross was carrying a load that he couldn't put down. He was carrying a burden of sin. And as the other criminal told him, you know, we're here because we've done wrong. We've committed wrong. And, and, and here, what does that first criminal say? He, uh, he mocks Jesus and, uh, and yells insults at him. And he says, if you're the Messiah, save yourself, but also save us. Bring us down from the cross because we don't want to face the judgment upon our sin. We don't want to face up to what our lives deserve because the Bible says that sin deserves death. We, we just fight our sentence against us that God has against us. God as a holy God has against us this sentence of spiritual eternal death. And, and we'd rather say to Jesus, take us down from the cross. And God is a holy God. He can't deal with our sin like that. He has to be both love, absolutely amazing love, but he also has to be absolutely holy and just. And the penalty of sin has to be paid. And, and sometimes we don't always see how heavy this box is that we're carrying, how, how big it is. In, in 1 Timothy 5, it, it says, Some people's sins are obvious, preceding them to judgment. But the sins of others surface or follow later. Uh, we, we had a chief executive once as a client, and uh, we'd see him fairly regularly to talk about his building. And uh, I turned up for a meeting one day, and he wasn't there. And I, I said, oh, where's uh, so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, they said, oh, he's had to leave. It, it was a money problem, uh, other people's money that he was spending. And, uh, and he just disappeared off the scene. I think I saw the, the case in the paper some months later. But some sin, this was going on while I was just relating to him, but I had no idea of what was happening. And some of our sin... We, it, it just happens under the surface. Others, it's obvious. And this man's sin, as he went to the cross, it had become obvious. The Roman government had declared it as obvious and it had to be dealt with. And he wanted to save himself. He wanted to save uh, Jesus. He wanted Jesus to save him from that. There was no covering because perhaps in a way, the hardest thing to see is our own sin. When uh, Jesus healed the blind man, um, he, uh, in, in John chapter 9, um, some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and they said, well, we aren't blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. It's sort of a little bit complicated, but that what, he's try what Jesus is trying to say to them, if, if you see your life and think there's nothing wrong with your life, you're blind, even though you think you're seeing. And this first criminal just could not see that he was worthy of death and uh, as an outward action, but then there was a deeper thing of his heart and he wanted Jesus to take him down and have nothing to do with judgment. And that man was going to carry his burden of sin into eternity. No cloak or covering at all. Well, if we finished there, it would be a pretty discouraging, a pretty discouraging message. But that's, as, as McLeod said, that's the whole reason Jesus came to deal with this burden of sin. And so we come to the man in the middle, Jesus. And the amazing thing is, if, uh, if you looked over the, you can imagine the, um, the soldiers there, the centurions and the soldiers who were crucifying the, the three men, and uh, if you looked over the shoulder at the clipboard of uh, uh, you know, crucifixions for today, 
Good Friday, you've got uh, criminal number one, and then you've got uh, Barabbas, and then you've got criminal number three, criminal one, two, and three. And then you say Barabbas, but uh, hang on a minute, that's not Barabbas on the middle cross, that's Jesus Christ. And Barabbas was a mur- he was a, a person in prison, he was uh, a murderer, and uh, when Pontius Pilate came to look at Jesus, and, uh, and uh, he, it, it says there in, earlier on in Luke 23, uh, Pilate says, you've brought me this man as one who misleads the people, that's Jesus, but in fact, after examining him in your presence, I've found no grounds to charge this man with those things you accuse him of. Neither is Herod, because he sent him back to us. Clearly, he's done nothing to deserve death. And, and the crowd cries out, release Barabbas for us, because he'd been thrown into prison for a rebellion in the city and for murder. And uh, they said, crucify him, crucify Jesus. And, and Pilate says, this man has done nothing wrong. There's no grounds for the death penalty. But he handed Jesus over. And you know, Barabbas could say, Jesus took my place. And that's what a Christian is. A person who says that Jesus took my place on the cross, that what I deserved, Jesus did for me. You know, even the criminals, you sort of know your own kind in a way, But even the criminals knew this man has done nothing wrong. And and when the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God saying, this man was righteous, was innocent. And as you go through the Gospels and you look at this man, Jesus, you see his power, his power over disease, his power over nature to just stop the waves on on the lake and and his power over demons and 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 even his power over death he was fully man but he is also fully God and you see his forgiveness his care for his mother his, his care for a lost sinner and and so the bible is very clear that when Jesus died as an innocent man as the one pure eternal sacrifice it says uh, God says he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God Jesus could not come down from the cross because he was being made sin for us so that we might receive the righteousness of God and so like just like Barabbas I can say, when I come to Jesus in faith, he took my place. No wonder it sort of became dark in the middle of the day and and the veil of the temple was torn in half to just demonstrate that, that now through Jesus we could enter in to the very presence of God. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's, that's the sort of depth of the cross that it's not just another crucifixion, but he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. That um, when you go to Hebrews chapter 10, it says, God the Father prepared a body for Jesus. And it's in this body, through the offering of this body of Jesus Christ, truly man, fully man, mankind, that he was able to take our place on the cross. That's amazing love. It, it's an incredible love that he would give himself for me. And, and it becomes even greater when we realise this was no, no sort of uh, just accident, as though God right from the start knew that we would kill the Prince of Peace, that we would kill the Prince of Life. 
and get God in his sovereignty, in his, as it says in Acts 2, his deliberate plan and foreknowledge. You, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. And yet God used that to deliver us, to take our load, our load of sin, that heavy parcel that we're carrying and have got nowhere to put it down. We can put it down at Jesus' feet. And he gives us the gift of righteousness. So let's come to the third man. You know, actually in the other Gospels, in Matthew 27, it says that both thieves abused Jesus and uh, just just had a go at Jesus. They both wanted him to take them down and save, save them. They reviled him, it says. And I want to say to you this morning that this third person, this third cross, in one sense shows us what it means to become a Christian. To become a Christian is to have a new attitude towards sin and a new attitude towards Jesus. That God changes our heart about my own sinfulness, that I'm prepared to acknowledge that. And that's repentance. It's a change of mind. It's a change of thinking about sin in my life. And then a change of attitude about Jesus, that I've perhaps never had any time for Jesus. And God helps me to focus upon him and put my faith in him to trust him. What happened with this second criminal? He saw perhaps... Perhaps he heard or saw that Jesus on the way to the cross when the women were weeping and uh, about him, he said, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. Here was someone headed for death and yet still thinking about others. That was the whole thing of the cross. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about us, about others. And, And then he... And then on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. And I wonder whether God used that in his life to say, perhaps in Jesus there's a hope that I could be forgiven, that I could receive forgiveness, that the penalty of my sin could be paid, that there would be somewhere I could lay down my burden of sin. Repent, he rebuked the other thief. He says, you know, we deserve this. We, we've done wrong. That was repentance, says, Lord, I'm wrong and, and you're right. Uh, I no longer have any excuses. And he saw a place of forgiveness where he could lay his guilty burden down. There's a, a lovely old hymn that says, Lord... I believe were sinners more than sands upon the ocean shore. You have for all a ransom paid, for all a full atonement made. He said, don't you even fear God to the other criminals, seeing we're under the same condemnation. The first thief wanted to be saved without having to deal with his sin. The second thief saw that Jesus was the only answer for him to lay down his burden. And, and it's a beautiful picture. I remember uh, Jason shared with us about, uh, you know, how he never had any opportunity to try and get his life right. You know, he was, he was almost dying, almost entering eternity. And Jesus spoke to him. And, and he said, Lord, remember me. Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. There's, there's a beautiful verse as we come to finish where Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. What did he have in mind when he said, Jesus, remember me? when you come in your kingdom, was this some vague hope of a future? And Jesus says, no, today, today you will be with me in paradise. 
And will you remember me? No, today you will actually be with me in paradise. And, and, and where? Is this some sort of purgatory where I have to try and make myself better to make myself acceptable? No, today you will be with me in paradise in heaven, in the heavenly garden that I've prepared for eternity, you will be with me. Jesus, I want us to remember as we come to the cross, Jesus always gives us far more than we can even ask or think. He's that kind of saviour. He's that kind of Lord. And it's a beautiful thing when you put your life under his lordship under his control and you trust him to forgive that burden of sin in your life and he comes with full full forgiveness he, he comes with his own righteousness the righteousness of God as we saw totally innocent before his heavenly father and an absolute forgiveness forever and a new life abundant so let's come to those three crosses this morning and perhaps you're still at the first cross and you've yet to give your burden of sin to Jesus. And Jesus is running toward you and he wants to take that burden of sin and give you the gift of righteousness, of eternal life, of forgiveness. And, and then we come to see Jesus and his amazing love t toward us and all that he went through for us. And, uh, and we can come to know him and he always will give us far more than we can ever ask for or think about. We can enter into this life today. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today it's a beautiful day to remember our Lord and uh, we have communion set up each side and if you have come to know Jesus personally as your Lord and Saviour we invite you to join with us in remembering our Lord to take to take uh, the bread symbolizing his body there on the cross his body he bore our sin in his own body on the cross and and his blood that was given to wash away our sins, to make us righteous in him. And perhaps you're still on that spiritual journey of thinking about these things. We just encourage, we, it's so great that you're able to join with us. And we just encourage you to sit there and, and to think about these things that you've heard this morning about Jesus and the cross. And uh, and the uh, what we're going to see on Sunday morning, the, it, it's not just about the cross, it's the amazing resurrection to life of Jesus and Jesus wants to offer us resurrection, life. So let's come and remember our Lord as we come around the table.